many things. Hibbing is known to many as the uh, home of the domestic American uh, iron ore mining operation that supports our, our, our massive steel industry in this country, uh, which is very important. Uh, Hibbing is the home of the Greyhound Bus Museum. Not everyone knows that the Greyhound, uh, the Greyhound Bus Company uh, began in Hibbing and uh, became the mighty transportation giant of the country, even though the buses don't come to Hibbing anymore. <laughs> we don't like to talk about that. Uh, but, but maybe I get the feeling that most of you are here for a different reason. I felt this was the place to be at this time of year. Something we've been looking forward to for a long time. And I was always a big fan of him. Most of you are here because in the 1950s, graduating in 1959, a young man named Robert Zimmerman uh, graduated from Hibbing High School, having grown up here, and uh, went on to become a guy, some guy, um, named Bob Dylan. Oh, they love him. I drove 1,500 miles, almost exactly 1,500 miles to make a pilgrimage to uh, Dylan's hometown for Dylan Days. You know, kind of become a little obsessed, you know, just kind of like, you know. <laughs> just, a just a little. A little. A little. A little. <laughs> Has anyone here in town heard someone say Bobby Dylan? <laughs> they still do that sometimes. It, it, it does happen. It, uh, but locally, he's, he's, he's Bob Zimmerman. He's Avon Beatty's kid, uh, Bobby Zimmerman. And the folks here in Hibbing are, uh, are welcoming, welcoming all of you to, to celebrate the impact this guy from Hibbing had. Well, it seems like he invented a lot of the styles that we use. And he's explored so many different genres. Um, which, which makes him his music in, endlessly fascinating. I think this is a good thing to honor him. I think, I think it's all right. No thing class, it's all right. And we were remarking on the fact that a, a, a world-class poet, musician, composer came from here. Well, it ain't no use to sit and wonder why. I'd be. If you don't know by now, it's so easy to say, oh, Bob Dylan. Isn't it weird that he came from Hibbing? You know, that's just weird. No, I didn't know you said Wonder Why. It don't matter anyhow. But everybody has to come from somewhere. But since that time, we've wondered about the, the genesis of his songs and the effect of Hibbing. But part of his, part of his um, move towards who he is was reforming himself when he when he left Hibbing but certainly the influences are here. Hibbing was kind of a melting pot because of the Iron Range. There was work up here so we had a lot of different ethnic groups up here. People were very strong especially our parents and grandparents on being good Americans, good citizens. They really appreciated the fact that this country had taken them in. These are the iron mines really in the early times. It was a very um, rich ore area and so the mines from the east coast came this way and figured that out. As the mining went along they realized that underneath this town they created were really the rich veins of ore. And we had a mayor called Vic Power and he was a very smart mayor. He said if you're going to move this town you should make it worthwhile for the community to move. If you would like to make money underneath the earth of these homes, then wherever the town is going to be relocated should have stellar things like the Android Hotel and the beautiful high school. And that's a picture of North Hibbing before it moved. Fourth of July parade, the dirt streets are cool. We have very rich roots in history and the town did move, yes it did. Hibbing is all this stuff that we know about Hibbing 
it's easy to romanticise it to be about Bob. It's not anything to do with Bob on the one hand. I mean, this is, they're just amazing things about this town in general. But all those things are things Bob would have known about growing up and you can see the influence. The fact that the town's on the edge of this giant hole, it's on the edge of an abyss. And the fact that the town moved and Dylan songs are so much about travelling and going down the highway. And uh, the fact that Greyhound started in the town and there's all these romantic associations. Well, it's bad news of Charles Sing the Blue. I've been walking around the city, uh, just walking around as I feel he might have, Bob Dylan might have when he was a child. And For music tourism fans, place is very important. Where things happen, it provides context. The, the high school is, 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 inc is an incredible place. And mining built that school back in the heyday. It'll last forever. Even if Bob hadn't gone to this high school, it's, it's truly a, it's a stupendous building. But these originally were in the Carnegie Library. Any uh, student, I think, you, there must be a special feeling going to that school every day. It's on a grand scale. It, it looks like it should be you know, a government house or, or something. And it's, it's a high school in, in a town of, what, 18,000 people now. <laughs> Now, when you imagine Bob and you see the stage that Bob performed on and you think anyone else, oh, it's his first public performance, it's probably just a potsy little stage somewhere. This, if you get stage yeah, right on this stage, we're in yeah. And this place is Carnegie Hall, like it's huge. Well, there's six foot wide chandeliers. They're literally irreplaceable. It's, it's amazing that Bob, that Bob could play there. Going to the high school, that is a, that is a great place to visit. I think that, that's the highlight of my time in Hibby. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a theory about this. Rather than be faced on a daily basis with distractions from curious Dylan geeks like myself, I said, okay, let's just make a clean breast of it. We'll put the painting on the garage door. Yes, this is the place. Take a look and then go away. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like seeing it, I'm suddenly like, oh, now I get him. Now I get what he's all about, because he was born in a house that was blue. You know, th this explains everything about Bob. This is the missing piece in the puzzle. That's not true. Um, but at the same time, you don't walk around and think, how could Bob come from a place like this? He fits in here. He really does. The years that he lived here from six years old to 18, he'll always be in him. And his music reflects it. It's amazing. Uh, the cultural awareness of his words to where we live here. Our marquee um, has a girl from the North Country on it, and uh, Echo Star Hellstrom is her name, and she was Bob's girlfriend for about a year and a half or two years in high school, and we like to think of her as the muse for Bob. It's sort of heartbreak, uh, you know, Girl from the North Country, which I played, uh, It Ain't Me Babe, uh, Boots of Spanish Leather, a bunch of these love songs, these, these are broken love songs. He wrote about some of the same girls. She was like Bob and most of his friends very artistic and creative and would think outside the box of things that they were exposed to. They weren't sports jocks, they were artists as young as they were. You know, they used to just roam the streets here together, just uh, listening to records and uh, that other people didn't really like. All of us, it's cute, have had our little moments of songs that we see coming from Hibbing in the Iron Range area. It's, it's wonderful. He's written songs like North Country Blues about miners' rights. B.J. Rolfson, Bob's English teacher, he would have told you that With God on Our Side was from one of his classroom um, lessons that he was teaching Bob because he could relate to the lyrics in there that everyone would think that God was on their side. And when Bob saw him in 2005, here in town, I got to stand next to Bob when they were talking, BJ and Bob, and he said, you taught me a lot. And it was genuine and, and how sweet. You 
you know, this 84-year-old English teacher from Bob's past, uh, to say those words really meant a lot to BJ. So BJ will always be a part of the Bob story here because he was instrumental in teaching him poetry and literature. and uh, He lived and breathed uh, English and literature and wonderful man. We miss him. It's interesting for a musician uh, in that this is one of the only events I know of where the focus is another musician and where you're really focused on his music. I'm gonna take this badge off of me. That's the story of the world. But it won't be over till the clear is known. Pin him down. You can't label him. You can't pigeonhole him or his music. Oh, sister, am I not a brother to you? That is that you play a Bob Dylan tune and then you play one of your own songs and it's a singer-songwriter competition. Um, I'm gonna play one of my own and then I'm probably gonna do Tangled Up in Blue. science teacher really liked Bob Dylan, so uh, I was like, I should check Bob Dylan out because I really liked my science teacher. A lot of the songs that he does have uh, talk about life experiences that he hasn't experienced yet, obviously. Interesting to hear that and how he absorbs it, I think, and, and perhaps tries to relate to it. Bob Dylan has been my, my company through, throughout most of my adult life. In fact, Bob Dylan's most recent collection of original songs is Together Through Life, and uh, it's kind of the way it's been for me. You know, when he first, when Bob Dylan first started singing, I didn't didn't really love him. I was more into the Beatles type stuff. But as as I got older, 
got to really like his music. I know you did. Now Austin, Austin bought me a, a, a CD. A CD, and I told him, I said, if you ever want to buy me another one, get me the best hits number three. <laughs> So I think that's part of the artist's burden, that the f they're sometimes ahead of the fans. It took me a while to see I like Bob Dylan, but my two brothers... Bob Dylan's got to grow on you, you can't just, yeah. I don't think you automatically like it. Well, I think the first song I heard by Bob Dylan was Isis, Off Desire, and um, I don't know, it was something just really good, because I liked Jack White from The White Stripes, and he I know he did a lot of Bob Dylan covers, and so I, I don't know, something about the like, way the words flow with the music, I guess. I mean, it opens my eyes when I read the lyrics and listen to the music in terms of crafting songs and, and fitting words into songs and fitting music into words and stuff. It's an interesting process. It's fun to watch. It seems like you can sing you know, topics through songs in front of complete strangers that you're told never to talk about with complete strangers. Like, take the big three, you know, politics, religion, and legal activity. And you know, Dylan sang songs about all those. You might be a rock and roll addict dancing on stage. Might have drugs at your command, women in a cage. You might be a businessman, some hard to do thief. They might call you a doctor, they might call you chief. But you're gonna have to serve somebody. Did. I got a, I got a copy of one of his songbooks with the words in it, and without him singing, and he's very intellectual, very philosophical. And I really liked, I liked a lot of his songs. Then I started to. Now I'm even appreciating his voice a lot more than I used to. But you're gonna have to serve somebody. like Johnny Cash. I never liked him when he first started out. No. And you listen to Johnny Cash and his raspy voice. And... Mm -hmm. But as I got older, I got to like that. Same thing with Bob Dylan. But he's a, you know, he's a genius when he you read the words. Of, he wrote a lot of songs that he never sang. Yes. I was asking Peter if he was playing. He said, no, he wasn't ready for it. But... Good job yesterday, Alex. Great. Yeah, especially the Dylan tune, it was hot stuff. Yes. <laughs> Huge Dylan fan of up to 37 Dylan shows now. And when I was in Madison, I, I met Charlie Sexton on the street, Bob's guitar player. And I told him how many shows I was at. He said, you should get your head examined. That's what he said to me. I thought, you've been to hundreds of shows. They are, they are crazy people, and you should, be, you should be worried about them. And I can say that because I'm one of them. Dylan Geeks. And then in the uh, songwriting competition, I did my original song, which is called I'm a Bigger Dylan Fan Than You. And it's a uh, affectionate parody of the kind of people who, who come to these events. And some of, my, some of my great friends in Sydney, we have a society in Sydney, a Dylan society, that we all meet up together once a month. And I've met some fantastic people there. And I was thinking about what a funny crew they were. And I wrote this song. So I traveled up to Iggy and I hung out at Malibu. I knew the alternating pronouns, entangled up in blue. I was a little worried that people would, might be offended by the song or, or think I was, I, I, my heart wasn't in the right place, but I, I shouldn't have worried because everyone was on board from the start. I get every I know every other source. I think the real life ain't even the truth and the force. I know that he and I be best friends if only you and I'm a bigger villain than you. And when he gets to heaven, I might take my
my own life too. Is there anybody here from, like, Calcutta? <laughs> Kathmandu. Kathmandu. There's a guy from Germany, there's a, someone from Paris, there's a lovely couple from you Liverpool. I think you won the prize for coming the farthest to Dylan Days. We have a prize for him. Oh. Oh my God, is that appropriate? It's, it's a shrimp on the barbie. <laughs> Um, and they gave me uh, a Barbie doll with a shrimp on it, so the shrimp on the Barbie. So that was fantastic. Music is a fabulous vehicle for meeting people and getting around, as your kids know. Yeah? I mean, these are my best friends right now. These guys from Canada and yeah. from... Where'd you get your hat? Uh, uh, <laughs> a gas station. Really? I did come here searching for friendships with people who love Dylan as much as I do. And I've already done that. And my journey takes me far beyond. And where are you going this morning, son? I'm setting off to find my lady fair. And how will you know when you've found her, son? In fact, as I was checking into my local hotel, I met two guys in the lobby and we've been hanging out ever since. The place is obviously committed to Bob Dylan, so I think that's really, and that's fun for me. Uh, just to like be around people and places that are, you know, focused around it. Oh, did you catch a little bit of that? I caught a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting a little louder than I normally do, but it's your fault buying me those drinks. Dylan, uh, he brings people together, you know, and I formed some friendships here in 24 hours that, I, that might take me weeks in other places all because of Bob. They're wonderful people. I, I've now hung out with Dylan fans on three continents, my own country and in England and here in America, and I've never met one that was a bad person. They're, 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 they're good souls. Spin around the water. Yeah, that's on the face of the deep. Spin around the I can't hardly sleep. Feel free to clap, it doesn't bother me. The people who support local music, or not technically I'm local because you guys are from Canada, but just amateur musicians, I mean, these guys make the world go round. Right? No, we... Everybody's here to listen, you know, so that, that kind of supports, to me, it supports the energy of the, of the creative person. Uh, it, it, it really helps to have an accepting and listening audience. I, I paid for my uh, lodging last night with music. I thought that was really cool. Oh, nice. I got like a shower and some uh, food this morning. I wish I could do that every night of the, my life, actually. Let's get some sugar. He's a professor of marketing, and he joins us today to introduce his new film, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Lieber. <laughs> okay, well, uh, good afternoon. I'm going to talk about uh, Bob Dylan's concert in Manchester in 1966, a very famous concert. It, one of the loudest concerts, I think, up to then. I remember all the chaos and the confusion and the shouts, etc., but I don't specifically remember Judas. No. There's quite a hostile crowd, there's lots of booing and a shout of Judas from the audience, which seems to uh, kind of incense Dylan, and he rips into uh, like a rolling stone. I thought, oh my God, you know, we've blown it. Dylan will never return, he's <laughs> never going to come back. Very famous concert, and I thought I'd bring it to, to Dylan days because people are interested in all things Dylan. And I think what was interesting is I interviewed people and one of the key messages was how uh, Dylan was true to himself and just kept going. Perhaps, or a Hibbing trait, is his indefatigable stubbornness. And we know that the, the stories about when he was at high school and he's playing Little Richard on the piano at the high school, um, and the, the head of the high school pulls out the plug on the amps, but Dylan keeps pounding away. And there, there were people with 
performing dogs and juggling and this, that and the other. And it was, it, I, I think it's noted as the very first confrontation with Dylan and an audience. He's a genius who, who tells it the way he thinks it is. Not, he doesn't pander to his audience. And that is, that takes great bravery. And I think if you look around Hibbing, very tough environment. One of the reasons he left because of the unconscionable winners we have up here. You've got to be tough to survive in the hostile environment. As long as you're not afraid of the bumps in the night. On the surface, it's like so many other towns, but it, sound, it sounds cliche, but there is, there's something in the air up here. I just wrote three songs. There's, like he said, there's something in the air here, I think. The people from Hibbing in particular have, have been fantastic. Yeah, you're the ghost who lives inside. They are very straightforward, very honest, and I like that. It's, it's authentic, and if you're into music tourism, the key thing you want is authenticity. And here, you've got it in bucket loads, and it's great. A really interesting place. Um, I, I think I've fallen in love with Hibbing and, and its culture. It is very different. Uh, it's not gregarious. You can imagine Bob growing up here and you, and you can feel what it would have been like for him and, and why he, he, he turned into to what he is. I mean, I think people from cities don't necessarily have that same drive. Dylan is so much part of the Iron Range. He is a true Iron Ranger. Uh, tells it like it is, uh, matter of fact, uh, but deep down, tremendous core values. And I think you can pick that up in his music, in his lyrics, and the just way he just keeps going on. Come in masters of war. You're that build the big guns You're that build the death plane You're that build all the bombs I feel like what inspired him, or inspired me most about him was uh, just that he was just a guy with a guitar You're that hide behind desks I just want you to know I can see through your fans And he was able to do it, and that's all I do is I'm just a guy with a guitar and uh, I feel like, you know, uh, he was able to do it. Someone else, you know, might be able to do that. Also, I mean, uh, obviously he uh, was the voice of, you know, a revolution, a generation, all that kind of stuff. Well, you've thrown the worst fear. Well, that can never be her. Which I was not alive for. into the world oh, and my baby I'm born in her name you ain't the blood that flows in your veins but when looking back I mean he spoke what everyone else was trying to say I've tried to do that on certain things but we just don't have the platform that he had anymore um, it's harder to become uh, a uh, we don't have a Dylan anymore. It's what you're made of, it's your formative years, and he's that guy, you know. And you can, we know, because we live here, we see that in him. It's, it's very positive and very uh, joyous for us to celebrate him for that reason. Yeah.
All right, uh, Monty Edmondson, uh, he's been playing uh, even ever since you fired Bob, right? All right, so he's going to entertain us. This is, a, this is a special treat. Backtracking a little bit, Monty and myself kind of jammed a lot. Monty played great guitar. I played drums. One day, we are walking downtown to my job and Monty's job, and Bob says, hey, you guys, are you been jamming? Let's go uh, meet you in my garage Saturday. We'll do a few tunes. So I said, sure, why not? Train around Yeah. We, and then we start playing. Uh, pra we did, I, I can't say practice because Bob did not like the word practice. He said we play music, not once and over and over. Back in '55, he had a guitar player named Scotty Moore with him. Scotty played it this way. We start playing in his garage. And uh, for a few weeks, every Saturday, we'd meet in Bob's garage, the one attached to the house, and we'd uh, do a lot of songs, the songs I never heard of, because Bob listened to all these Shreveport songs. But as a drummer, you can do anything, you can pick up any song. Pray, pray. Come on, down, down that line. The local radio station still played the uh, old standard music. Uh, Bob had gotten into listening to a program in Shreveport, Louisiana that had a lot of blues to it. And up here nobody really knew what blues was. Years later, James Burton joined him and sung something like this. There was no good music in Hibbing, so we listened to the Loop Station, WEBC, because he played rock and roll. It's easy to imagine when you're here, Bob as, an, as, as a teenager, up in his bedroom on a cold winter night in Hibbing, listen, listening to AM radio and just absorbing like a sponge all the new music that was coming out in the 50s. No Name Jive, Muddy Waters, whatever. Train, train. Coming on down, down that track. Well, one of the things that Bob said, and I'm kind of paraphrasing this, that long he said, I'm like a funnel. I take everything in one end, it comes out the other end me. And he was training himself, training his ear at the time. It's easy to imagine that, yeah. Back in the days when eight or ten different groups would record a song, this one was done. The style I do it is Sutton Smith and the Redheads. Anybody remember them? Yeah. Well, sing along if you know it. Be sure it's true when you say I love you. It's a sin. A rock band was a little strange at that time. The rock music had probably been out about two or three years before Bob and Leroy and I formed the band. Just because these words were spoken. Uh, I used to read about them. I knew their names 40 years before I met them because they're in all the books. If you rubbed yeah. elbows with, with Dylan, you know, you were part of history, yeah. you know, back then, you know. This one is during a, like a winter frolic competition. They did that at the Little Theater. And this was in Monty Edwardson's scrapbook. And it's a small theater that's inside of our big memorial arena. The name for the golden chords. Leroy had a set of drums that were in gold. So that golden part came out of there and the chords came out of the, the different chords that I used on the song. We put a lot of extra chords into some of these songs and so we just decided that was going to be the golden chords. And Monty is still a great guitar player. He is really good. And Monty was so good on the guitar. All Bob would do was hum a song, and pretty sure Monty would have it. They were just great guys and really uh, 
really kind and, and, and were just happy to talk about themselves and about Bob and yeah, they, I mean they're part of history too. They really are. Get over here, your dad's got to take another picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, you want to shake his hand? Yeah. yeah, get in here. Yeah. yeah. Monty's a nice man. He's a nice guy. It sounds Leroy. Yeah. yeah. Sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. But of course, you know, they're, they're just because they played with Bob Dylan 50 years ago, I mean, why shouldn't they be nice anyway? I mean, even yeah. if, even yeah. if they were Bob Dylan, why shouldn't he be nice? Yeah. Which he is now, yeah. apparently. He's really mellowed in his old age. So be sure it's true when you say I love you. It's a sin to tell love. You knew what he wanted. He knew years back what he wanted. Well, I screwed up with Leo yesterday. He he came Leroy. in and he, Leroy. Leroy, he he was he looked he said I'm tired. I said oh yeah. I said I said are you just visiting? He said no I'm a musician. As with the, is it Gold Tones or Golden Tones, whatever they were, the, the first band? Go golden Chords. Golden Chords, yeah. I said, oh yeah, what kind of music do you do? I mean, I had no idea, right? Then I found out he was in the original, original band. And Bob would say, Leroy, keep it simple. He did not want pounding on the drums three, four times, four, four times. He wanted, he wanted to be the center of attention. So, so we did. I said, well, that's easy to do, you know. So we kind of kept it quiet, and the music had feeling, and that's the main thing. It was, it was really decent music, really neat. And then we played in his garage. His mother was such a bubbly person. His mother would say, Bobby, Bobby, you know, it's getting kind of loud. And he'd say, yeah, Mom. <laughs> Bob had seen the movie with Little Richard in it, so when he played piano, he was trying to imitate Little Richard's mannerisms. Monty said, let's do a rock hop and hit him. So, because Duluth is doing it a lot. So he said, okay, so we rented the armory, uh, hired a police, hired a cleanup clean up person, and it was a Saturday night. There was nothing for the kids to do. Have you seen this? Uh 1959, is it? To see Monty Edinson, Leroy, and Bobby Zimmerman for 50 cents. They bought an ad in the Hibbing Tribune, and that's what that is. It's an old copy of the one ad. They could only afford to buy one ad. And we call this Bob's concert, first concert, because he said, you know, this is the first time I got paid to play music. Well, Blue, stay away from me. Pretty much so. Well, of a wild, looked at as a wild group, you know. It was different, probably, what punk rockers look like to us these days. So we had some some kids that were really into it. They really enjoyed it, and others just thought we were kind of a loud comedy act. So we had another rock band, Leroy and I, after that, and that band was very well accepted. And Bob formed another group that. Uh, with a couple of other friends of his after that, and uh, I think they were better accepted than we were. We were kind of the icebreakers, I guess, in the rock music up here. So and when you got something new, it's just natural. People are maybe be uh, a little opposed to it, you might say. And then we just uh, kind of drifted off in different areas. I was ended up going to Japan in service playing in country bands, and then I stayed with country bands for about 50 years. Don't know why could What happened with the transition from playing whatever you played with Dylan to this? Six months of doing this. Just to get that thumb going and get my ear acoustic, acoustic trained to the difference of a straight pick and a thumb pick. When you reach 16 or 15, you know there's a bigger world out there. And obviously, he loved music. He would listen to the radio and and absorb all that. And in his mind, Hibbing was very small and culturally defective, or you know there just wasn't enough happening here. He could go to Duluth and see concerts, but it just really wasn't the hub of things. So. When he graduated from high school, he ran away. <laughs> I was aware that his song had been picked up by um, Peter, Paul, and Mary, 
And when I would come home on leave, I would see his mother and she would kind of update me on what's going on with Bob and everything. I don't think he comes here too much, but I don't think Minnesota was too nice to him. So. There's so much uh, rumor that he doesn't want to come here because of what happened to him when he was younger, but I don't know if all that's true. People like to fuel the negative um, of their relationship when it's not really valid. From what I understand, the rebellious young man who ended up in New York was trying to make an image for himself. He was a very good tall tale teller, a very good storyteller. I mean, obviously his early career was all that. So he loved that. He loved to spin a yarn about being, you know, in the circus and, uh, and you know, he wanted to protect his family, really. Everybody wants me to be just who I am. Everybody wants me to be just like them. They say you say you're a slave and you know I just get bored. I think that was part of the era then. I can remember when Buddy Holly was famous and we would play out of town. All of a sudden, we weren't from Hibbing either. We were from some place like Lubbock, Texas. Probably some of these other towns uh, that Bob has claimed to be from in his past. Uh, part of the marketing, maybe. Maybe some brilliant marketing, you never know. I mean, if he would have just said I was from Hibbing and just left it at that, nothing exciting, but when uh, his hometown and his background changes all the time, it uh, stirs up some interest. Kept the media going for years. When we talk to family, there's this Bob Dylan that um, he gets in front of a million people a year and does his entertainment, his business, his work. And uh, then there's this bo guy, Bobby, or Robert, as BJ used to call him, who takes care of his family and cares about them, is protective and nurturing. And um, that guy was the one who probably distracted the media from hitting and, you know, really didn't want his family to be burdened with a lot of that load. And, um, and it ended up being kind of a really media relationship that made it look very tainted, and it really isn't. So there's this Bob Dylan guy, and then there's Robert Zimmerman, and they're two different people, really. I really don't know why Bob changed that. You know, you hear all kinds of different stories on why he did it, and, but I guess that's his business on how he did that. But it's, it's almost like they're two different people. grown into a major icon in this life. Come gather around people. There's not an awful lot of music going on on the range, at least not as much as I would like to see. So this is a chance to, you know, do something original and hear other people sort of from this area or, or at least people that are connected to what Dylan, what I think Dylan stands for, which is being original and being authentic. I mean, it's special, but uh, maybe more special to me, Bob Dylan. Here, I'll pull it over here. This is the stuff people seem to like the most to look at, you know. Well, it's Dylan days. So I got Bob Dylan with me in the van, so. <laughs> I know something that uh, that's on a lot of people's minds is um, that we'd all like Bob Dylan to come back to uh, Hibbing. Um, personally, I'd like to see Bobby Zimmerman come back home. And uh, I'd like to learn about the Bob Dylan of my age, at, like 15. Why can't I be back? I'm on the track. 
said through the years that he's come, but he's such a private man and doesn't want the tension on him, and, but they he said that he's come. He never wanted a lot of publicity, no. so I wouldn't be surprised he's been up here many times and we just haven't known it. Now I am home. My son knows every detail about uh, Every, about oh, the, every trivia question. I, he used to swim, uh, sing one of those songs. Like a rolling like stone. A, like a rolling stone. And he was, he could sing it pretty good. <laughs> Didn't have the voice Bob Dylan had, but he could, he could sing it pretty good. I think he had a better voice. <laughs> 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 oh, that's for sure. in the way they're like why are they celebrating it even though he's never going to show up but they still do it just because they respect him that much and then other people think they're like ah that's Dylan because they know Dylan's not going to come here well we're hoping by by doing this with Duluth doing this and Hibbing doing this, and maybe we can get him back home. Get him back up here for another concert. I know they've tried to get him to play. People here love him, a lot of people do, so hopefully someday maybe they'll do a festival with him playing. That's what I'd like to see. There was a campaign last year about Come Home Bob. Yeah. Uh, whether or not he was coming home, I was going to support it, and that sign still stands in my yard today. You, know, you can only hang out so long wishing <laughs> the real thing was here, you know? That's cool. Come home, Bob. It's the closest thing I can br bring him to the real thing. Hopefully someday the real thing will come and uh, everybody will be much happier. The ultimate would be to move here and live here and work at Zimmy's and be a part of the crew. That would be the ultimate. It would. And when we sat down, to rename the restaurant a little more casual name. I said, I don't think you people will realize how, how big Bob Dylan is everywhere in the world except Hibbing, Minnesota. Dylan is global, absolutely global. I knew a guy that used to sell him guitars in Minneapolis, uh, in St. Paul, and uh, he wanted Bob to see the painting. So I brought it down to the concert. I was standing at the side road, listening to the billboard now. And then I never actually got on the bus with him. I was standing at the side road, listening to the billboard now. I was a little intimidated. Well, my wrist was empty, but my nerves were kicking. Oh, they were ticking like a clock. So then I saw him later, and I just went up to him on, uh, when he was on the bus, and I explained the, the painting and what was behind it. And he, uh, he saw the photo and he just said, oh, it looks pretty good, you know. While I was waiting my turn to speak to him at this funeral, politely, then the camera crew from Duluth was running across the lawn at him with a big microphone and camera. And I was stunned because we were at a funeral and I look over and he's running across the lawn the other way as fast as he can. They didn't catch him, he's pretty swift. Um, but, you know, yeah, I missed my magic moment to introduce myself. Oh, it's funny, honey, I'm out of touch. Just don't feel much like a scarecrow today. It was close. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if he's ever been to Zimmy's. It was cute because his nephews came in here. Um, David's sons came in for lunch, and we talked for a couple hours. After, this is after the funeral. And um, I said, oh, you didn't bring Bob along, your Uncle Bob. And they said, you know, he was with us. And when we drove by your marquee sign, he said, Zimmy's. <laughs> and they said, yeah, Uncle Bob, that's named for you. And then the camera crew was here, of course, waiting for Bob. So he told them he would go somewhere else. And 
they came in. Oh, he was here? But he went to a coffee shop in town because someone got his autograph there. It's hard to believe, but I believe it. You know, I mean, I don't think he's ever said he's not going to come here. Or... He did spend the day, which was nice, but yeah, it's tough to be Bob. Don't need a shot of turpentine on a great man to my name. opened up in uh, 1990, um, people in town weren't sure, they would tell us they're not sure if the family would like this, you know, kind of that, you know, heavy hand, a little negativism, and we were like, well, we're doing nothing, you know, we didn't even have any memorabilia, it was all history of Hibbing memorabilia on the walls. Put a price on his head. Zimmerman came in, this is his mom, Beatty. And um, I was a little nervous to speak with her. I was a manager and I thought maybe she wouldn't, I don't, I didn't know what to expect. So what I did was I um, went up to her table and I said, you know, we've named Zimmy's for your um, son, Bob, and you know, I hope you like it. And she said, quote unquote, my husband laughs when I say this all the time, but she said to me, honey, it's about time somebody did something nice for my son here in Hibbing. I said, well, I'm very happy to hear that because we didn't know how you'd feel. And she said, well, I was born and raised in Hibbing and I raised my two sons here and I can never figure out why no one did something for Bob, you know, to acknowledge his career. And I said to her, you know, we've been putting ads in the Hibbing Daily Tribune to see if we could get a picture or two of Bob growing up here. And she said, oh, don't worry, I'll send you some photos of Bob from Hibbing. Well, needless to say, I never got any. And I think Bob would have killed her if Mom would have sent us photos, <laughs> family photos. But it was really nice to get that, like, that it, blessings or whatever you want to call it, that she was fine with it. And after that, we put up the Bob Dylan memorabilia. If you're a doctor, I need a shot of All right, well, this is the Zimmy's lunch menu. I thought they'd have a Bob Dylan special today. <laughs> Do you have a special you know, we No, barbecued beef sandwich. Oh, that sounds good. Barbecue beef sandwich. No, I don't like that. Positively all you can eat fish fry, simple twist of steak. What are you gonna get, dear? I don't know yet. Then over here there's a hard rain hamburger, the Mozambique black bean burger. I don't want that. Let's put an order on your rings. Yes, sure. <laughs> Song for me. And the Forever Young Walnut Veggie Burger. Well, I know the song Forever Young. I forget who sings it now. But it's just a beautiful song. And, and Ross told me that Bob Dylan wrote that song. And I was just shocked. And then there's Love and Theft Coconut Chicken. Mm -hmm. I promise to go. Sandwiches. Well, there's a Zimmy's double cheeseburger. They're all song names, and well, that some albums, and you know, just references to the the Big Dylan. Um, and then here is Highway 61 pizza. Is that the one you were thinking about of Highway 61? Is that the song? I don't remember it. I don't remember the name of it, but Highway Highway 61. This is an old vintage one. Um, we were a part of the exhibit, uh, Bob Dylan's American Journey, and they had a Highway 61 sign in the exhibit, and we thought ours was better, so we were, we were rocking, we liked that. <laughs> Did his father own a, a furniture store here, Zimmerman's? Probably. Yeah. The clock up above was the Zimmerman electric clock. Zimmy's is a nifty place. I like how it's laid out. It's nice and open feeling, not too cluttered, but it just is packed full of things. You, 
just keep looking and see something else and new. It's hard to absorb it all. I just notice it, it's kind of the face, the mosaic face of Dylan. Very interesting. I love it when he was with the traveling wallberries. I think I think that's a, a phenomenal group put together. An autographed card with the traveling wallberries. So that's Bob and all the traveling wallberries. They're very artistic here. They yes. have a lot of artwork very dedicated nice. to Bob, which is really good. They have a lot of stuff that you don't see anywhere. That's Bob at about two and a half years old. So they would have lived in Duluth, but this is actually shot in Hibbing. She came to visit her two girlfriends from high school, and they all had little toddlers. So it's on a porch here in Hibbing, and it was kind of fun for us to get because no one had seen a baby Bob picture. We call this our baby Bob. But isn't he adorable? My God, would you fall in love with this guy? <laughs> oh, yeah, these are all Hibbing related things. Oh, that's, that's really neat. 1958. <laughs> That's the year he graduated, I think. Yeah. Just always a celebration of arts, you know, all the arts, poetry, literature. Actually, this lady here, a uh, writer, amazing, uh, just fantastic. Play competitions. So we try and keep the arts alive because it's very hard to keep the arts alive in a very small and off the beaten path community. So that's our mission, if you will. So hopefully we think Bob would love that. And as um, artists ourselves, we really do. We, we feel um, very validated in trying to keep things alive here with that. You say you're looking for someone we are always To protect you and defend you Whether you are right or wrong Did you see this close? Gary Ivan, my New Yorker, he goes, look, his mom was still dressing him. He had penny loafers and khakis, a little, like, almost like a little bolo or whatever they call those style ties. He was a little nerdy because he was only 16 or something, you know. Look at 1956. Bob got a motorcycle, Harley, 45, and he said, let's, uh, let's go cruising. So we did, and we are driving in Brooklyn, it's right out of town. And a train was going by. And Bob was in the front with his Harley, and he was a little anxious, or as Leroy would say. Independent, impatient, and restless. And as soon as the end of the train went by, Bob took off. Oh, there were two tracks, too. You're going to just see one today. Not to know that there was another train coming on the tracks across the other direction. Bob threw his bike down. Yeah, the train was just missing him. Unbelievable. And when the train went by, Bob got up, picked up his Harley. He, did, he never wanted to talk about it. It could have been the original one of the tracks here. He never acknowledged it happened. So, okay, that's how he is. And he never talked about people. He never talked about his family, his friends. Uh, like I said, he was so independent. He never, he never really gossiped about anybody. And that one, of course, 58, when he was a little cooler. <laughs> but isn't that amazing? Liverpool and Memphis are very successful at promoting the commercial aspects of tourism. Uh, it really is a, a, a mass market product. I think here in Hibbing, it's more a niche market uh, for, for Dylan fans. Mama, can this really be the end? Tickets stuck inside a gold deal with the Memphis Blues again. It's a long way from most places. You really have to be committed to come here. So I think the people who come here are the real hardcore fans. And I think what the hardcore fan is looking for is not glitz. My grandpa died last week. Now he's buried in the rocks. And 
It's not cheesy, it's not kitschy, it's not like the Bob Dylan Vegas show. Liverpool or uh, Memphis, the whole Elvis or Beatles thing, they sort of overdo it, which that's all you see when you go there is just the Elvis or the Beatles. Whereas here, they, I mean, obviously we've got Zimmy's, we've got his home, his high school, his auditorium, but uh, people still li live life here as if it was just regular life. I don't want to be patronized. I know what I'm looking for. I'm a big fan. I know the story. I want to, in a way, discover it myself. Mama, in a way, I think hipping, through its unpretentiousness and its, its lack of um, overt sort of promotion of, of Dylan is actually the correct way. As far as like, you know, rock and roll history and all of the icons, you know, Beatles, Rolling Stones, Dylan, he definitely stands out among them as being one who's not like the other one. Sometimes my body is more than I can bear. Elvis, the Beatles, Dylan are heritage. They are based in, they, are, they have a cultural aspect which means they have longevity because things will live on. Bob Dylan has made the most important contribution to American songwriting in the post-war era. That's, I, that's how I sum it up when I'm talking with my friends. And I just traveled around Australia seeing him live and he was, he was spectacular. And for him to be doing that at 70 years old is, I, I can't imagine. I'm getting tired after two songs and he'll play a two hour set every night. To me, there's, there's never ever gonna be another Dylan. It's hard to imagine a world without Bob. I don't even hear a mother of a prayer. Was it not dark here? The world will be a sadder place without him, and uh, uh, I, I hope he goes on forever. Certainly his music will live forever. From Dylan's last album, uh, a couple years ago. Not, um, his, 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 the last, the last one studio he's done, might more. I'm sure he's got more in him because I feel like uh, he's always had something to say. And for a while, if he didn't, he wouldn't put it out. But um, yeah, he's definitely got something to say. And especially now with the just life experiences, I feel like he has maybe more to say. Well, my ship is in the harbor and the sails are spread. Listen to me, pretty baby. Lay your hand upon my head. Beyond you lies nothing. Nothing done and nothing said. Absolutely, he's got ropes to travel. I mean, I'm, I'm personally a huge fan of the recent work. Like, I like it just as much as, as his, his work from the 60s that I guess his legacy is based on. Um, Love and Theft, his album from 2001, is my personal favorite Dylan album. A Christmas album recently, which I actually like because I love Christmas music. Look at someone like B.B. King. He's 85 and he's still doing it and he's still fantastic. When we came, we said, we're just going for fun. That's why we came and we had a good time. So that's, that's the key. That's what it was about. That's the key. Met people, yeah. met lots of good people, good players. Yeah, it's good. We're lucky. Lucky to have music. Do you, you play anymore? We should get rolling up here. You're gonna make me wonder what I'm doing. Stand far behind without you. Oh, you're heading out. Do you have to leave us? Well, this is so wonderful. You really got to hang out, Laura. Oh, Thanks I'm for so coming glad. to everything. I know you well, guys you know usually what? go to the it's, lake. It's like the old heart and soul here. You guys yeah. draw these people together because it's a real experience. Oh, yeah. And people leave very, very Is it like satisfied. the Winnipeg Folk Festival? It is. Oh, in good. the mini version. In a mini version. Yeah. I don't want it that big. You're gonna have to leave me now. I know. It's been a delight to meet you. Oh. I hear you play. Yeah. It was great oh. listening to you and your brother. I really enjoyed it. You guys have fun. You're gonna make me lonesome when you go. I'm gonna keep coming. Gotcha.
Keep yeah. coming. I'm here for the rest of my life. Say, they always ask me, okay, if Bob would come to town, say, Leroy, uh, what would you say to him? Talk about old times? I go, no, that's history. I say, let's go down to Zimmy's, check the place out, and have a drink. Uh, I think it's great that he has achieved what he has achieved in his lifetime. And it's always fun to say, yeah, I knew him, I played with him back, back in those years. Bob comes back to visit, but um, you know he'll never live here again. It's, he's moved into a different direction. And he lives in here, in my heart, and in the hearts of many Dylan fans, all Dylan fans. You bet. You bet. And I just cannot go home this way.